How can a concept for a single character expand into an entire civilization? Hey guys, quick question. Should I eat my friends to get around quickly? How can you introduce new concepts to an already established world and have it make sense? And can cities become sentient? I'm Carrie. I'm Josh. And I'm Monica. And this is the World Builders Podcast. I'm Carrie. Uh, I'm Josh. And I'm Monica. And this is the World Builders Podcast, because you can't build a planet without a plan. In this podcast, we, your host, explore settings in genre fiction by crafting them here and now for you, our listeners. Last time we talked about magic and how it helps the societies on Alteran and how its absence also affects those people. And now we're going to uh, dig a little bit deeper because... Really, stories have always classically had uh, three core points that's kind of unanimous across all cultures. And that's that stories exist to either educate or inform. This is, you know, tradition. This is the way we've done things. This is why we don't do these things. Stories entertain, obviously. You know, oh, tell me the one about, you know, so-and-so's great exploits. So on and so forth. And stories inspire you know i think every last one of us on this podcast and probably listening to this podcast has sat there and thought about what kind of jedi they would be what bender kingdom they would belong to you know so on and so forth extensively and so (laughs) one of the questions that you really want to see answered when you're creating you know content of any variety or you know particularly story crafting is what does my work inspire people to create? And in this episode, we're going to start finding out by taking a look at a player-created race for this campaign setting that we've been showcasing so far in the past six episodes. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at the uh, Torun. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we'll just start off at the beginning then. So... When we first started doing these Antheru Season Zero content, I decided that I wanted to make this certain character. And the creation of that character, Vilfreya, basically caused this domino effect of creating an entire species and civilization, pretty much. Um, This started with a couple of things. I had an idea pop into my head of a character who had guns that shoot magic. And I thought, that's a really cool freaking thing. The only problem is, is that in Xanthiru, or on Xanthiru, on the continent of Alteran, channeling as we know it, most of the races can channel somewhat on their own. So why do you need a character with guns who can shoot magic because let's be honest the own are probably the only people who would benefit from that and they're probably not going to use a gun when they can just use their hands (laughs) yes from what we know of them they they seem much more likely to get up close to someone and punch them than stand really far away and shoot them with something they don't really know how it works Yeah, for today's audio bit that really should be visible, the only guns they care about are the ones you can flex. (laughs) Yeah. So it got me to thinking of, well, okay, why does this person need guns that shoot magic? Well, she can't throw a fireball herself. She can't call down lightning herself. Maybe it's her species that typically can't channel in this way they can still channel but they have their own way that it manifests and so that's when i started getting into a little bit more of the torun abilities okay well they use their channeling to sense the flow of lay energy in the world and to maybe kind of ride the stream a little bit so so you basically took a rule of cool and made it fit in the world is what you're telling us yes 
technical types would call that reverse engineering. Because <laughs> I could have gone the route of just making her a human who can't channel, but then I would have had to have created this increasingly convoluted backstory as to why this one specific human can't channel the way other people can. Um, and to me, there are, there are varying approaches to this. This is just my personal approach. I'm not saying it's better or more right than anyone else's. This is just how I choose to do things. To me, the more convoluted of a path you have to take from point A to point B, the more it weakens the story. There's a reason electricity follows the path of least resistance. To me, it made more sense to, instead of creating this insane, like, weirdness and having to play fast and loose with the rules that Josh had already established in the world, and that is a main thing. Once you've established a rule in your world, don't break it. Yeah. Unless it's built into the rules that you can break it under these specific circumstances, and in that case, you need to set those up before it happens. But anyway... It was just easier and more elegant to just say, okay, these people channel differently. Right. And yeah, the most, the simplest answer is often the correct one. I don't remember who said that, but it's, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> it's a quote from someone. Um, I think that it's really important to look at, um, at how you can fit things into an established world. Um, it's, it's easy to, come up with new races, but do they actually fit? And I think that's, um, I think the way that you have taken it from just she can't ch channel to maybe these guys aren't that great at channeling is a way that you can actually fit them into the world that's already been created. Oh, and they're great at channeling, just not the same way that humans are. Okay. Because when looking at their abilities, like, okay, Josh has made it clear that every race on Alteran anyway, has the capacity to channel in some regard. It's just sometimes it's different from one species to another, and some of them value it more or less than others. So they can channel, but let's see, what would what's a way that would be different? I know, teleporting is really cool. They're a race of teleporters. <laughs> teleporting is great. Uh, and it has gotten this character out of many bad situations very quickly. Yes. Uh, which, which is great. And so from there, I sort of started exploring, well, what are the other ways that this, you know, how, how are they teleporting? Because obviously there's different ways of doing it. You know, there's, there's dimension door, there's phase step, there's all these different ways that people go about it in various settings. Um, there's traveling in the Wheel of Time, which is not technically teleportation, but might as well be. Um, which is you open up a door and walk through it. Um, so for me, with the Torun, I decided, oh, they're basically stepping into the flow of the light in the world and using it to get from point A to point B quicker than it would be to walk there. And so from there, we expand on it a little bit. Well, if they're doing that, clearly they must be able to sense the flow of the light very well, because otherwise they're not going to be able to navigate it. And so that's where we see the ability that Velfreya exhibits in Season Zero to sense the magic around them, kind of tell where it's coming from, what type of energy is being channeled. It's because of her training in teleportation. So that might be a really good segue into what kind of... Um, you, say, you say that she had to train in teleportation. So how did that happen? That is a good question, because obviously all of these races, they're going to have to learn how to do it. And basically, I just made it part of Torun culture. It is inborn in every child that they have the capacity to start channeling at some point. And so obviously, if you're a culture of people who know how to teleport, and you know that your kid, as part of their natural instinct, is going to start to try and channel... You might want to teach them how to control it before your kid says, ooh, that fire is pretty, and teleports themselves into the fireplace because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, fun fact, I tried to do that when I was a child. You tried teleporting? Uh, no, but I tried to go into a wood stove. I put my hands flat on a wood stove that was burning when I was a child. Uh, and Ow. I 
still don't have feeling in some of my fingers. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's my fun fact for the day. Imagine having that instinct and also being able to teleport. Oh yeah, that would have been bad. I don't think I would be alive right now if that was the case. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so there's the answer to that problem. Oh, it is a part of every Torun child's education that they learn how to control their channeling at the same time as they learn things like how to read and write. And obviously certain of them are going to then, once they learn how to control it, certain of them are going to train their abilities more than others. And that's where you get things like, in RPG terms, them taking extra points in the movement skill. <laughs> this also just really makes me wonder when this capacity really starts to manifest in those people. Because you could just imagine, honey, where's the baby? <laughs> oh, gosh. It is for that reason that the ability manifests usually between the ages of five and ten years old. See, that is a very good, very good uh, restriction that you have placed on these children <laughs> <laughs> to make it easier um, to keep babies alive. I'm pretty sure that this was a trait that was selected for over thousands and thousands of years because any baby that did manifest it earlier likely did not exactly have. <laughs> <laughs> Rest in peace, Jimmy. He teleported into a wall. Thankfully, the open legend system accounts for that, because if you do teleport into a solid object by mistake, you get yeeted out of it and deposited in the first empty square available. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of my explorations of the Torun abilities were, this is awesome. How do I make it make sense in the world? And what limitations does it need? Yeah, because it's very easy to create something that's overpowered. Um, and particularly if you didn't create the world, it's really easy to go, oh, well, this thing isn't overpowered. Like, it's fine, right? Um, because you went with rule of cool. But coming up with sort of limitations on what can and can't be done is also is just as important as coming up with how they trained in being in teleporting so yeah exactly so like so for example with velfreya we see her ping-ponging all over the map in the season zero content well she's 28 years old so you think if even if she was a late bloomer even if her ability manifested when she was eight that's 20 years that she spent honing these abilities right the same way that that we we study like me, for example, like I'm in college, so I study ecology. Um, so she would be studying at the same at the same time as she's actually studying history and lore. She is also training her body to move with the light. So yes. just makes sense that she would be better at it than the average person. Mm -hmm. And also, there's like this cool exploration of cause and effect, right? Like, okay, you have these people that can teleport suddenly doors don't matter as much and suddenly like navigating through a city got a whole lot weirder so you have these whole extra layer of social responsibility and taboos and mores and etiquette that come with okay well i don't teleport through the streets unless it's an emergency because it's rude and also where i'm from it's illegal <laughs> You can't just teleport inside someone's house unless they say you can. Right. And I assume that the same thing would be, the same sort of taboo would be placed on teleporting with other people without their permission. Yes. Yeah. You don't, don't yeet your friends. It's not cool. In case of an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So there were, let's see. Yeah. So the three... I forget if I said two at the beginning of the episode, but it's three. Three main things that influenced me creating Valfreya and having a race spring up around her. The guns that shoot magic and then the teleportation that arose out of that. Um, there's also the fact that, as we discussed in the previous episodes, we have this whole culture surrounding the artifacts and all this lost history that was left behind by this ancient civilization however many hundreds or thousands of years ago that Zan and the Enlightened lived. Well, obviously, I as a player want to interact with that. 
we have a culture where being a ruin hunter, being an explorer is normal and expected because of what this world has been presented with. I want to play with that. I want to make an archaeologist. This archaeologist can get to places very easily because she can teleport. I bet this is a common trade in her culture. Because if you can get to hard to reach places very easily, chances are you're going to be more effective at finding cool things. Yeah. Especially if you don't have to climb uh, climb down into, like, spelunk into caves. You can just boop and they're there. Like... Yeah, and then we combine that with the whole, what I said a few episodes ago about really liking magic as a science. Well, these people are probably prone more to being archaeologists and explorers, and we have all of these artifacts that not a lot of people know what they do when they're first found. Okay, they're a culture of scholars. They find this stuff... They catalog it. They research it. Because they're curious, just like... And that's one of the ways that you can sort of connect with this race, is that, like, they're inherently curious about that time, the like, the Enlightenment time, and they want to know more about it. And you, as a reader or as a as a, an audience member, want to know more about it um, because of how it's set up. So it it gives you a really nice uh, sort of in to that plot line, I guess. Yeah. And then that sort of informs their place in the world. Okay. You can usually find them in places where there are libraries. They probably have one of their own. If you find them in the wild, they are most likely going to be an archeologist, a librarian, a cartographer. And it just got me thinking more and more about, well, obviously these guys are collecting all of this information and they obviously have this drive to explore and to find things out well also here's a problem zan chose all of these enlightened all of these students to learn from him the tarun were on the continent when this happened where do they fit in all of this because all of the enlightened were alte they were all human so where do a society of highly inquisitive scholars fit into this maybe they were the archivists Ooh. maybe they were the neutral party writing all this stuff down and keeping track of all this information and that's where my idea of the lore keepers came from which ended up growing into a society of organization that existed during the enlightenment that wrote all this stuff down that is what they did But here's the problem with that. You now have an entire civilization of people that are dedicated to preserving knowledge. But we lost all of that knowledge when the Enlightenment ended. So what happened? Right. Where did it go? Because you can't suddenly plonk down a group of archivists into a world where lost knowledge is a main plot point. And have it make sense. Right, yeah, because they would, would have wanted to keep records of, of those things, so something must have happened. Um, there, you would, you would get a lot of, like, you would probably get a lot of comments if you were to write something like this and not think of that. Um, yeah. Like, man, this is a really big hole. Why don't they just already know this stuff? They are the ones who were writing it down, duh. Exactly. Which brings into my third inspiration for writing Velfreya and the Torun, which is, I love the idea of things like the lost city of Atlantis, secret societies, the sense of mystery that comes from where did this entire freaking city go that is really cool to me. So, okay, they had this big city with this huge library and all of this knowledge, it's not there anymore. It vanished. It teleported away. <laughs> <laughs> the city has become sentient. Yes, their city was actually a transformer that got up and left. No. <laughs> it got up and danced away. So, okay, cool. That's where that's where it went. They don't know where it went. Or maybe they do, but if they do, they're not telling you. 
and it kind of fits too because we talked about the history so Zan just teleported away like I mean not I don't know the actual like how did he leave but you know what he had built um was just gone so from the eyes of the people who saw it it looked like he just teleported away (laughs) right exactly but yeah so he left um and it makes sense that when he left so did so did this city vanish um i don't know it just seems to make sense in my head yeah and so that's kind of where this whole thing came from with this great big city which is named kalanthal um that they had it it was great it was an amazing repository of knowledge i mean it's everything that zan had in his library but this was designed to be the backup if something goes wrong you can come here and we've got all of this stuff in duplicate so we're cool we can share it with the world and be all right but now it's gone what happened to it why did it vanish and how did it vanish well obviously it's boring for the i know how it vanished but it's boring for the reader to know how to vanish because then like obviously your character can just go find it if you know where it went and how Right, and also it takes that mystery element that you were talking about out of it. Okay, so this the city vanished. Mm-hmm. Did the people in it vanish? Or is it just the city? Yes and no. Uh, some of them disappeared. Because obviously there's still Turun in the world. Um, and one of the things that I came up with about these people as I'm exploring their tendency to explore and learn things is that a lot of the Torun themselves have this sort of inborn wanderlust where they're driven to go from one place to another to see new things, to meet new people, to find new stories. So even though they once upon a time had this amazing city with this huge freaking library, not all of them stayed put. The ones who did want to stay put did, and a lot of them were the ones who were the librarians who took care of the city Um, But a lot of them would only come back home every so often, and they would spend the rest of their time in other places. They would visit the other races, the other people, the other countries, and write down their stories, ask permission to copy down bits of folklore and listen to it and bring it back to add to the library and then go off to the um, the next place. So so not very many people would, or not very many Torun would, would spend their whole lives in this city or in, in any one place. Yeah, I'd say it was, it was, back in the day, it was probably about half and half. Yeah, because you, you wouldn't have a city if you didn't have anybody staying in there, obviously. Exactly. Um, but a lot of them, even though it was home, they fel- always felt this drive to see the next new thing. And so a lot of them were out of the house when suddenly their house was gone right and they would come back and see nothing uh and then honey did you leave the oven on (laughs) (laughs) and then all of the the that knowledge that was in in these archives just disappeared yep um so those Turin would have had to learn how to fend for themselves for the first time right after the disappearance of all of their friends and maybe even some of their family yep that sounds terrifying (laughs) like having to navigate a new world uh not a new world but a world without zan i mean it was basically a new world at that point (laughs) (laughs) well all right yeah so having to navigate this new the the new status quo i guess the new paradigm there we go and still wanting i can imagine that some of them would still want to carry on those traditions of writing down stories and 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 gathering knowledge but they don't have anywhere to put it now so did they keep doing that they did in their own way um a lot of them shifted to looking for their home um Obviously, it's very concerning when an entire city just leaves, and I imagine that the Tatroon were not the only ones who went looking for Kalanthal after it vanished. Um, 
some of them decided that, you know what, you guys go out and, and keep searching. I will take care of all of the stuff that you find. I'm going to live here in this city with the, with the Voskari. They've offered me a place to stay. And I'm going to start a bookshop. And you come here, we'll bind all of the things and all of your notes into books and have them here. Or maybe they are going to contribute to their host countries, where instead of giving stuff to the Kalenthal Library, they will obviously keep their own stuff to distribute among their people, but they might write books and donate them to the Tolvera Library instead. Right. And so, so they didn't want to build another city. They were their intent on finding the one that disappeared. Well, they didn't want to build a new city. It was part of that, but also this ties into the reason that Colin Thal vanished. Because what led up to that was, and here's where I was, again, trying to figure out how the Torun fit within the history that Josh had already established. Because you can't write something into a world, whether it's your own or somebody else's, without making sure that all the puzzle pieces line up. Because if they don't, your readers will notice it. Even if they don't consciously notice it, it will feel off. Right. So we have this city, Kalenthal, that was designated as a backup. We have Zan's city suddenly vanishing. What do we know about the period immediately after Zan vanished? Nothing. Uh, I'll take, it really sucked for 500, Alex? (laughs) What was it? Roughly a hundred years of constant war and shifting territories and people killing each other? At least. Conservative estimate. So, you have the city, the Zan city vanishing. You have a bunch of people trying to fight over the scraps. And you have a city with a library full of everything that Zan had. What do you suppose happened? (laughs) So... The way it kind of played out in my head and the way I ended up writing it down is that first, everything went the way it was supposed to. Kalenthal took in the refugees that were stranded when Zen left and began trying to teach them things. They opened the doors to their library. They are trying to share their knowledge. But what do we know about humans and living sapient beings in general for worlds that have more than just humans? Um, I mean, they don't share very well, Um, I've noticed. Yeah. We have all these people that are coming and going from the library, more and more and more and more of them as refugees keep pouring in, probably way more than the city of Kalenthal can handle. And even with them trying to find accommodations for all these people, there probably wasn't enough room. In this chaos, you also have all of these strangers coming and going from the library. Right. Isn't it only natural to assume that eventually books would start walking out and not coming back? Probably. Which is unfortunate because that's the whole, like, the whole point of having the library is that they're archiving knowledge. And then that knowledge gets abused. And lo and behold, here's a, here's a city that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you do not want to share, you cannot have it at all is really how that looks so yeah okay so the torun are like listen we really don't want to do this but we're going to have to close the doors not let anybody in we'll still share our knowledge with you but we're going to teach you in classes instead of just letting you wander off with our books because we're going to lose them all if we don't do this true so now you have a bunch of people who are upset because they just lost their home they are lost they are scared. They are hungry. The city is doing their best to provide for everybody, but there's not enough to go around because they're trying to scramble to get all these resources. And then they close the doors on the knowledge that everyone's trying to get. Right. So you get unrest building up. Very angry refugees. Yeah. And obviously there's debates on how well the Turun handled it and what they could have done or should have done differently. They were just trying their best. (laughs) They were still trying to provide for everybody, but it's difficult. And then 
what else do we have going on in this world? We have some very upset people that all this knowledge went away. And that's when I thought, well, what about the enlightened? They're not immortal anymore. Some of them might be upset about that. Yeah, I mean, if I was immortal, effectively immortal, and then suddenly I'm no longer immortal, uh, yeah, I'm going to be kind of mad. <laughs> yeah. And so I ran this by Josh and we had had a discussion of, okay, well, this one particular, you know, these two of the enlightened are dead um, already. Of the two who are left, neither one of them would be the kind to really, like, be that upset. They would be like, yeah, we kind of deserve this and do what they can to set up for the future. Um, and that's when I thought, well, what about their families? It's true. Just because they were immortal didn't, doesn't mean they didn't have a family. And so you have the families of the enlightened who... Maybe they don't like that mom's not immortal anymore. They don't think it's right. They don't think it's fair that mom should have to die because these other two people were dicks. It's true. Here is a city that supposedly had a copy of everything Zan and his students ever wrote down. Including, at least according to this person, hey, those people probably know how to be immortal. Right. Although, if they, if they knew how to be immortal... They would probably do it themselves. Well, yeah, but since when do people make sense when they're angry? I guess that's fair. That is true. Yeah, I make the least sense when I'm angry, so. <laughs> and that's where the idea came to me of a lovely fellow by the name of Dristan Sulroth, named after his mother, Roth the Enlightened, who decided that he wanted what the Torun had because clearly they're, they're just hoarding it. They've already shut their doors on all these refugees. They've clearly got something to hide. Of course. If they won't share it, I'll just take it. Ah. I'm going to bring my army to their doorstep and make sure that I get it from them. That's a way to do it. Now, <laughs> the Torun at this point had fended off a number of incursions of people who thought the same thing Dristan did. But they're a race of teleporters who knew a lot about artifacts you march on a city of teleporters who have a lot of artifacts and suddenly your army is 10,000 miles away from there right exactly <laughs> that was i like okay cool we're just bye like <laughs> bye bye army <laughs> so that is so that i assume that is what they did to to this guy not to this guy because if you think about it if you have all of these enlightened with their magical armies. Every now and then, someone is probably going to be a dick and go rogue. Especially if they're really angry. Yeah. So what do you do if you have a channeler that goes rogue? Well, you have a military police that has the technology to block them from channeling so you can arrest them. Which makes sense. So you have this guy who's in charge of this army of military police who can block channeling. And he decides, I'm going to march on the city of teleporters. Oh, I see. I see. He's the guy who hit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yuck. So suddenly they can't teleport his army away because their channeling is blocked. And even if you're using an artifact that enables long distance teleportation, if you can't channel, you can't use it. Right. Which makes sense because... The whole magic system is based on that. So <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter how big the gun is if it has no ammunition. <laughs> exactly. So Dristan Sulroth and his army of Justicars, because of course the magic military police are going to have a super pretentious name. So of course they are. I would, be, I would be disappointed if they didn't. And if he's this full of himself to think clearly they have this thing because I want it and they're hiding something... He's going to be a little self-important. And let's be honest, some of the kids of the Enlightened probably were very self-important about the position that they perceive themselves to have inherited in society. Yeah, it's very easy to, to think yourself better than another person because of the way of who your parents are. Yeah. So they march on the city. They start from the inside out and they're, or the outside in, excuse me. And they're working very carefully because obviously you can't just raise a city if your goal is to recover the library. 
true so if you burn the whole thing down there's no point <laughs> right and the thing about the torun is they're not a militaristic people they're explorers they're scientists they're scholars they know a little bit about how to defend themselves and how to de-escalate conflict in a city full of refugees but they don't have an army they can't fight back against this they've been yeeting their potential invaders across the continent for however long <laughs> I like that because of the sort of lifestyle you've chosen for the Torun, they don't seem like they would be militaristic. And also they seem fairly solo when they're, when they're out in the world um, rather than being like traveling in groups and, and militarizing. Um, they know self-defense and they, they know how to find artifacts. They don't ask for stories they're not really concerned with having an army. So it makes sense that they would have a difficult time defending a city against someone like this who, who is intent on... Um, on taking something they don't have. Yeah, exactly. On, you know, intent on, on like raiding the city for no actual reason. Yeah. And that's... So he's working his way in very slowly and... The Torun are obviously getting more and more desperate. And that is when the city of Kalanthal vanished. Right on the night before he was poised to finally march on the city and take what he was after, which ironically they did not have. <laughs> Spoiler alert, they don't got it. <laughs> I mean, I didn't think they had it anyway, because yeah. if they had it, it, if they knew the answer to immortality, then a lot of this would be moot. Yeah, because here's the thing. Zan is a smart man and the Enlightened are smart people. They would have known that there is certain stuff that, if something happens to the world, should not be duplicated. So either they never had it in the first place because Zan or one of the Enlightened blocked them from copying certain things and said, no, you can't have this. It has to stay in Zan City. Or Zan just took it with him when he left. Right. And that... Either one could uh, could be could could be the answer, really. Yeah. So, Dristend was getting ready to march on the city. His final big swoop to capture everything. Wakes up in the morning, and his army is freaking the hell out because where there was once this massive gleaming city, there is a patch of smooth, unbroken earth. There was no noise. There was no fire. No mass exodus of people in the night. They are just gone. Which, it's so, uh, it's so difficult. The city should have left some sort of trace. Because it's a city. It's not like they didn't exist. Um, and they were surrounded by a hostile army. You would think someone would have seen something. Right, right, exactly. You would, you would think. Uh, but no, apparently not. Nope, it's just gone. It's just gone. And I find it... I find it really interesting because it's like, sure, you can go, you can go look for it where it was, but where do you look from, like, where do you go from there? Um, so the, the Tarun that decided to go and try and find their, find their city intrigue me because like, where do you even start from that? That is the problem that a lot of them faced. A lot of them were like, shrug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. After a certain point, I imagine that the ones who did keep looking for it were considered a little bit crazy. Um, that that sounds about right. I'm sure a lot of them did go a little bit crazy, especially the ones who had spouses or family members who vanished. That in their grief, they were unable to stop looking for it. That's true. So you have this split population. If the city is still out there somewhere, then all those people are still there. Right, you would think. Or at least the descendants thereof, unless they really do possess the secret of immortality. <laughs> and then so that sort of... And this is something that I was actually thinking of just recently, is, okay, Roth did not want her son to go after the Turun. She told him not to, and he did anyway. So I would imagine that she was kind of pissed with him and probably kicked him out. <laughs> Took away his toys. Probably. Uh, especially because, like, 
I told you not to go do this thing. And you also made an entire city disappear. <laughs> but mom. <laughs> Only Josh can confirm that because Roth is his character, but I imagine she was not happy. I mean, let's be fair. They already lost their essential figure of society because two of her non-biological siblings couldn't behave themselves. And then her kid goes and pulls to that. <laughs> which which is a similar, not the same, obviously, because it's not like... Similar to, but legally distinct from. <laughs> It's definitely similar uh, in in attitude. Um, <laughs> Did you learn nothing? <laughs> exactly, exactly. He didn't. That was the problem. <clears throat> that is the problem. <laughs> but, you know, there are some characters who just don't learn. Like, I told you not to do it that way, and they still do it. So, really. Which also made me wonder, were any reparations made to the Torun? Like, did Roth decide? Because we see, in Season 0, we see a pretty decently sized Torun neighborhood within the city of Tolvera. Did Roth offer them that? Do they get some kind of like, hey, we can live in this little group and say not have to pay property taxes on it because Roth's kid took away our home? It's a good question. So there, there's the, the history of the lost city of, of Kalenthal. Um, and then we have this fun little group that I call the Artificers, because again, I'd like this whole thing of secret societies, right? Right. To add more, add more mystery around, around an already mysterious. <laughs> um. add, add a little bit of mystery, add a little bit of superstition. And according to the people in, in the world, these are two completely distinct things, completely distinct organizations. But... What do you have when you have a world full of people who have access to world-bending technology and humans are sometimes dicks? People being dicks a lot to each other. <laughs> yeah. You might have somebody who finds an artifact that can heal the most grievous of wounds, even if you're not a very skilled cha channeler. One person finds that they might found a hospital. And invite everyone to come and be healed for free. And all they ask is that you donate something that you're able to, whether it's money, labor, here's some bread I baked to feed your patients, something. Or you might have somebody who founds a hospital and says, it is 10,000 pulse marks to heal your wife's illness. And... If I'm honest, most people are gonna mo most people who would get that kind of artifact would be the second group. Um, we don't again. We don't share very well. We really don't, and that kind of made me picture this group of people, like basically an urban legend, right? Like you don't know if they actually exist. You've never actually seen them, but my aunt's friend's sister's cousin former college roommate <laughs> told me one time that if you play too much with the artifacts and you abuse their power enough the artificers are gonna come and take it away from you it's like um baba yaga <laughs> like that's that's what immediately was conjured in my head it's like drawing sort of connections to our folk tales of like like, if you're bad, then Baba Yaga's gonna get you, mm -hmm. um, which absolutely was used on me when I was a child. And it doesn't matter how much you lock up your precious treasure that you're using to extort or brainwash or hurt people, if you abuse it enough, it's gonna vanish. Yeah, I mean, because they can teleport. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, we know that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. Um... <laughs> um. But yeah, you can put guards outside the storeroom. You can put ten different locks with ten different keys and combinations on it, but somehow it eventually goes missing. You put it in at night, you go in the next morning, it's not there. Heck, they can even get around the sliding block puzzles. <laughs> and, you know, words evolve over time, so these people might be referred to as the artificers, they might be referred to as the tinkers or the borrowers. 
some people have started saying, oh, they make their own artifacts. They've uncovered lost technology that lets them make their own stuff that gets them into these places. But, you know, if you if you mess if you mess with artifacts too much, you might wind up getting it taken away from you. I like that idea because uh, because it does add a little bit more mystery for the characters who are playing in this world, um, because they may not know that they actually exist and may not know that Torun can teleport, especially because especially if it's a taboo to do it in cities, um, if it's a taboo to do it without someone's permission or when people are around who don't really know that the Tarun can teleport, they may not realize that the Tarun can do that. Um, and it just kind of adds like a, a sort of mysterious, like uh, extra element to it that just makes me very happy. Yeah, so from the outside, it was my way of trying to contribute a little bit of folklore, a little bit of of mystery to the world of people you know using this to scare their kids of oh if you play if you if you're playing outside and you happen to uncover something you better turn it in because you know bad things might happen with you if you try and use it wrong other than the fact that if you try and use an artifact you don't know it might blow up in your face it might wipe your memory it might just make you stop existing you don't know So also don't play with artifacts you find randomly in the ground because of that, but also <laughs> don't abuse them. Um, and then from the, from the Torun side of it, their entire city and a good portion of their population vanish, never to be heard from again, because the Justicars were using their technology to hurt other people. So let's make sure that never happens again. Let's use our ability to slip into the light and kind of manipulate physical space to relieve people of the artifacts that they are using to hurt other people. Right. And keep them, keep, keep them safe from themselves. Mm -hmm. Obviously they know that it's breaking and entering is wrong. They know that stealing is wrong. And they know that it is kind of arrogant of them to presume to pass moral judgment on other people. However, it is a choice that they have chosen to make because if I steal this one object, these dozens of people in this town will stop suffering. So they're, they're serving the greater good. That is how they see it. Other people might disagree with them. <laughs> well, yeah, especially because you have to stop and consider, historically speaking, what backs currency? What do we currently base currency on? Usually the value of things like a treasury. What's, okay, let's go, go with the example of, well, what do we got locked up in Fort Knox? Ah, gold. Lots and lots and lots and lots of gold. Gold. What doesn't this continent have access to? Metal and gold. <laughs> so if they're going to have some form of you know, currency system greater than bartering, which, I mean, bartering's valid. Objectively speaking, we probably never should have gotten away from bartering, but I digress. You need something to give value to what you call currency because it's got to be worth something for it to be worth something. But if you don't have access to, you know, gemstones, precious metals, things like that, that are, you know, coveted and desired and can therefore give your country's currency value, what do you have? Your word? Eh, that's not going to be worth too much. So how about what, uh, what we've managed to collect? What artifacts we've got in our treasury? What we have that you guys don't? Might be something useful, might be something that doesn't even work, but if they've got it, it's worth something because somebody else doesn't have it. So we've got this culture on Alterin of people exploring ruins, digging up ancient information, ancient artifacts, things like that, and then giving them to their preferred country or the highest bidder so that there's more in that country's treasury to give value to their currency. So as you might imagine, people who say, no, that's dangerous, you can't have that, and then take it from you whether you say yes or no might not be the most well-accepted people out there in most countries. Yeah, they may not be liked very much. Which is a good thing no one really knows if they're real or not. Except certain people when Velfreya came out as one during season zero. Yes. 
Well, so so we so we know that the character is one, but not everybody does. Not everybody does. No, certainly it is if you are not Torun or a member of that specific adventuring party or like one other person who's referenced once, it is not a thing that you know. Whether or not you think the artificers are real, if you do think they're real, you don't know if they are a society, if they are a species that exists just to do this, or what have you. Do you even know that they're Torun? Definitely not. Do you even know if there are people or just one guy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody out there who just thinks it's Zan. That Zan stuck around and that he's taking things from people who misuse them because that's how he left. I mean, those people are wrong, but they probably exist. <laughs> <laughs> they're wrong, but also it's a good logic. It's a good, a good logic to follow, even though they're wrong. So that is how I combine several things that I like into a character who then, in order for this character to make sense, spawned an entire race and their civilization. But I mean, that's how the creative process works sometimes. We went from, I want to do this because of rule of cool to something that has an impact on the entirety of the continent, whether people realize they're there or not. Right. And yeah, so, so you can start from anywhere, really. Um, as long as you make it fit in the world. Yep. And then because I did not want yet another human colored fantasy race that is not humans. The Torun are primarily shades of really dark gray or really dark blue. Which is cool. See, they look cool and they do cool things and they're great. And they fit into the story. See, that's, I love them. Thank you. I love them too. That's why I keep writing about them. You should, you should. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you done good. And of course, obviously, I checked all of this with Josh, the original creator of the world, before making it canon. Because when you're writing with somebody and they give you a playground to play in, you want to make sure that you're following the rules of the playground. When you're also co-writing with a person who is doubling as your game master, there might be things that... I don't know about that he does that I could be breaking rules that I don't know exist. So like, for example, there is a certain story element in the side story I'm writing for Velfreya, where there was a thing that I ran past Josh and he told me, sorry, you have to change that because of spoilers. So I changed it until I reached something that made sense that I was happy with and that he said fit within the canon. Without giving out the spoilers, I might add. <laughs> yeah, because there's, there's, an, there's an element of trust there that has to go both ways if you're going to do this either as a game master or as a player. The, the game master or the world creator has to trust the people that they're essentially giving a set of keys to to not immediately drive the truck off of a cliff which is why some people do not like fan fictions. It's one of those things where like there are some authors that just really don't like that people write fan fictions of their work. But I think as collaborative storytellers um and especially with something like a tabletop role playing game, it's a lot easier to to sort of find find those places where those puzzle pieces fit together um, and actually work in the world that you're that you're playing in. Yeah, exactly. And I, as the person playing on the playground who was just given the keys to a shiny new truck, I have to trust that when Josh says, no, you cannot take a right turn here, that I have to either go straight or go left. I don't know whether there's trees, a cliff, or just a part of the road that he doesn't want me going down yet. But I just have to trust him when he says, please don't go in that direction. Right. And guess what? Me having to change that element that I originally wanted in the world to something else actually made for a better story. Go figure. Because sometimes the simplest solution is the right answer. But also, sometimes the first thing you think of, or even the second or third or fourth or fifth, is not the best one. That can actually be seen in that I have a novel idea that I have 
had done four different outlines for. And it still changes every single time I go to write. The Silva would be so proud. Yeah. For the fact that you're writing it down. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm not really writing it down. I've recorded some of it, like, orally recorded with my cell phone uh, while I was driving for one of the many jobs that I've, that I've had to drive for. But, yeah. So they'd be proud that I'm not actually writing it, but I am recording it. So setting it in stone a little bit. You're just reminding yourself of it for later. Yeah. Well, uh, sometimes I will get inspired with just like one line that I know I need to include, but I can't, like, I can't type it down. I'm in the middle of driving. So I just have my phone record it for me while I'm driving. I mean, let's be fair. One of the most beloved pieces of fiction in recent history started with in a hole in the ground, there lived the Hobbit. It's true. And that story went through so many different iterations until uh, Tolkien's children forced him to write it down because he kept telling it differently every time. But I thought you said his cloak was blue. <laughs> so I have to write it down so that, so that I know that, that this is the story now. <laughs> Covert, very dark blue ops. <laughs> and I have all this stuff written down as well, partially so I can show it to Josh, partially so I can keep track of it myself, and partially so that I can share it with people who are interested in Torun lore. We don't know anybody like that. Nah, <laughs> definitely not. So yeah, so you have this huge overarching thing that started with Rule of Cool and following the rules and that's why I made them the way I did, just to give us a little something different from what we normally see in fantasy worlds. Yeah. And that is absolutely, like, yeah, that's fair. There are so many fantasy and sci-fi races out there that are just humans with different things stuck on their heads or humans with different ears that, you know, let's have some gray people. Let's have some blue people in here. Have a little bit of diversity that you can only get in fantasy. Yeah, because, you know, especially when you're dealing with things like fantasy situations, diversity matters. Diversity always matters. And that's the Torun. I don't think we have any questions. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of questions, but nothing you can answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do have we do have a, a one particular fan. Hello, I know you're listening. Um, who has been trying since the season zero days to get hints about what happens to Colin Thal and specifically how it vanished. Um, I'm not telling because I want that to be a reveal in the story. Bwahaha. Oaha. Bwahaha. Josh knows. <laughs> Listen and find out. Laffo. <laughs> All right, that looks like we are just about at time. Indeed. So thank you guys so much for hanging out while I talk your ears off about the Torun. I feel like I have spoken almost the entirety of this episode and definitely more than I have in any of the other ones. So, Well, I bet Josh felt like that in, in many of the other episodes as well. <laughs> so uh, This is like one of my favorite episodes to record to date because I barely had to talk. It was wonderful. <laughs> but yeah, next time we're going to continue this, uh, this the expansion pack, so to speak. Um, we're going to have our good friend Raul on the show and we are going to take all of the questions that I asked myself about the Torun and we're going to throw them at him to discuss the race of one of our favorite characters, Fragul and his bear kindred. Yeah, it, uh, it might get a little grisly. Be prepared for all of the bear puns. They're pretty polarizing. Be prepared. <sighs> oh, I wish you guys could see the facepalm. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> If you guys would like to contact us, you can do so by shooting an email over to worldbuilders at rhinobot.net or by tweeting us at rhinobotstudios. 
We will be glad to answer fan questions on the air, but of course we record these episodes very well in advance and we edit them after. Uh, please be advised, it will take us several episodes to get to your question. Um, so bear with us, but we will. I promise. I see what get you did to your there. question. <laughs> bye bye. 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 This show is a member of the Rhinobot Studios family. For more information, including show listings, team member bios, social media links, and our community discord, please visit rhinobot.net.